أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وبسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والنازعات غرقا والناشطات نشطا والسابحات سبحا فالسابقات سبقا فالمدبرات أمرا يوم ترجف الراجفة تتبعها الرادفة قلوب يومئذ واجفة أبصارها خاشعة يقولون أئنا لمردودون في الحافرة أئذا كنا عظاما نخرة قالوا تلك إذا كرة خاسرة فإنما هي زجرة واحدة فإذا هم بالساهرة هل أتاك حديث موسى إذ ناداه ربه بالواد المقدس طوى اذهب إلى فرعون إنه طغى فقل هل لك إلى أن تزكى وأهديك إلى ربك فتخشى فأراه الآية الكبرى فكذب وعصى ثم أدبر يسعى فحشر فنادى فقال أنا ربكم الأعلى فأخذه الله نكال الآخرة والأولى إن في ذلك لعبرة لمن يخشى رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد everyone السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Today we're going to try to do at least half of Surah uh, Al-Nazi'at I don't think I can complete it today um, and that's okay. I'm not in a rush to finish the material. I'd rather just take my time and, and cover as much as we can absorb, inshallah ta'ala. So hopefully about half of the surah shall be covered today and we'll try to do the other half tomorrow. Um, and if I really have the energy left, maybe I'll call you in for a Monday and finish off the five surahs we're supposed to do because this one might take two days. Um, regardless, what I wanted to share with you today is a, a little bit of an orientation, uh, a challenge that I have as someone who's trying to give lectures on the Qur'an is that there are two things that I have to balance. On the one hand, as a student of the Qur'an, I have to look at all these differences of opinion that our scholars have had, the debates they've had historically about how should we interpret this ayah, and there are multiple ways of looking at it, and each point of view has its own evidences, and then counter-arguments and all of that. If I shared a lot of that with you, you would kind of lose the point of where we're going. So that a lot of that academic study is more for the student than it is for a general audience, right? And part of the intention of these lectures is actually not to be academic, even though I'm trying to be uh, more in depth than a brief explanation of the Quran. My, my job, part of my job is to try to do all of that research and do all of that study, and then try to present it in as easy language as possible. At the same time, I do want the bar to be raised for Muslims who are studying the Qur'an at any level. Whether you are just starting out or you're, you're, you've been studying Qur'an for a long time, there's certain like thought processes, there's a way of thinking about the Qur'an that's important to internalize. It's not just important that you know what I said. It's also important to know how are these conclusions being reached. How is somebody arriving at these conclusions? And so as I was studying for Surah Al-Nazi'at and reviewing my notes and all of it, uh, I came across a remarkable human being that I have, I, I feel sad that I didn't know her before. And I literally, I've been saying this all day. Um, I've been saying if she was alive today, I would apply for adoption. And I would ask her to adopt me. And if she didn't accept, I'd just sit outside her window all day and say, I ain't going anywhere, I need to sit with you. And that's Bint al-Shati, rahimahullah. Uh, this is a remarkable, remarkable scholar uh, from Egypt. She was a literary and she wrote on the Qur'an. She didn't finish a commentary on the Qur'an, but she wrote on several surahs. And whatever she's written is absolutely incredible. Does not get, it's, she's not nearly as known as she should be. What an incredible contrib contribution to the Qur'an. Literally, I may have studied 30 tafsir of Surah Al-Nazi'at and I read her 43 page commentary and I was like, I have never read anything. This is it. <laughs> It's, it's that beautiful. So what I've decided to do today, just once, first of all, we make dua for her. She's passed away, rahimahullah. 
And second of all, I'd like to take actually the, the lecture that I'm going to give to you today and base much of it on her work. Uh, because I see it as that comprehensive and that, that encompassing. Um, so today I begin with you know, a complication in the Qur'an, in the study of the Qur'an at least, which is in the Makki surahs, sometimes Allah takes an oath. He says, وَالْعَصْرِ وَالْفَجْرِ وَالْلَيْلِ وَالشَّمْسِ وَالْقَمَرِ right? So this surah begins, وَالنَّازِعَاتِ غَرْقَى That's how this surah begins, which are oaths in the Qur'an. Allah swears by a number of objects or a number of things. And a lot of interpretation exists, a lot of opinions exist about what this could mean, what these oaths could mean. There's a variety of opinions. And I'm going to open up my mushaf alongside my notes so I can read this to you and I can also help you, like give you an overview because you, you can't study this surah or at least some of these makan surahs, you can't study them ayah by ayah. You literally have to go passage by passage. And once you get a picture of an entire passage, then you go ayah by ayah back. And then you go to the next passage, get an overview, and then go ayah by ayah again. That's a systematic approach to study, especially these shorter surahs where the ayat are very, very short, and you won't understand the sense of them until you connect them to what's coming ahead of them. So today, when Allah says, وَالنَّازِعَاتِ غَرْقَى وَالنَّاشِطَاتِ نَشْطَى وَالسَّابِحَاتِ سَبْحَى فَالسَّابِقَاتِ سَبْقَى فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ أَمْرَى These five ayat are one passage. And these, this, let me briefly translate for you. And I will purposely make my translation confusing or ambiguous so you appreciate what the complication is. Allah says, I swear by those that pull as they drown. They pull as they drown. Nazi'ati gharqa. Wan nashitati nashta. And I swear by those that release completely. Completely let loose. Wasabihati sabha. And I swear by those that swim smoothly. Or swim rapidly, you could even say. فَسَابِقَاتِ sabqa. Then those that get, that march forward and get ahead. فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ amra. Then those that plan or execute the plan with perfect decision making. This is these five ayat. Now that seems very, very ambiguous. Who is pulling and what are they pulling? What are they releasing? What is swimming? What is getting ahead? And there were tons of opinions actually, and somebody called it out because they got excited. It is in fact one opinion, angels. But there are many other opinions even amongst Sahaba. So I'll start with that. What could be pulling and diving in? What's their opinion? They say that this is the angels that dive into people, they, they, they drown themselves inside ourselves and pull out our souls when we die. That's what it's referring to. And so if you interpret it that way, the rest of the five ayat are going to be based on this conclusion. Right? So then they're going to say, well, they dive in and they yank the soul out of the sinner. Because when the sinner's soul is pulled out, it's like, it's like pulling wool or like a piece of wool out of thorns. Like it tears as it pulls out. So that's that excruciating experience of the body, the soul being pulled out of the body. As opposed to when nashitati nashta, nasht means movement with smoothness and ease, bisuhula. And so it means that the believer's soul is taken out smoothly like water pouring out of a jug. It just smoothly comes out. And then wasabihati sabha fasabiqati sabqa, then these angels take the soul and they swim up to the skies. And they get ahead and ahead and ahead. Meaning they're racing to, for this soul to be judged. The one that's just been pulled out, it's the occasion of death. And then, فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ amra. Then they execute the command of Allah, what should we do with the soul? Should it be blessed? Should it be wretched? Should it be punished? Etc. That's the interpretation, right? That's not the only interpretation. And mind you, this interpretation does not come from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَهِيَ النُّجُومِ تَنْزِعُ مِنْ أُفُقِ لَا أُفُقِ عَنِ الْحَسَنْ وَقَتَادَ وَأَبِي عُبَيْدَ These are also sahaba. And it means they're stars, the ones that pull back. Like you know how stars fall sometimes? A shooting star? They, and they dive and they drown somewhere. And then the rest of the interpretation is based on stars drowning. Then another comes along. It's people that have gone far away from their homeland. And their homeland is constantly pulling at them. And they want to go back home. Or they have, you know, their religions that are constantly pulling at them and they don't want to leave their religions. <laughs> you see how many creative opinions there are in, in so many different directions on just one ayah? By the way, I'm not giving you the full list here. I found 39 early opinions 
on these ayat. And you could make a pretty strong criticism if it's 39 things, then it could be anything. Right? So we're gonna, we're gonna have to deal with that issue, inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, it's the bow that pulls on the arrow. And then it swims away in the air. And it ra- the arrow races ahead. And it hits who it's supposed to hit. Mudabbirati amra. Which is similar. It's the angels of death who take the, uh, the, the, the souls away. It's the wild animal that captures a sheep and is pulling it by its teeth. And taking it away. It's like, whoa. Or it's the, it's the, it's the horses of the Muslim warriors, meaning the mujahideen of that day, that are diving into the enemy forces and pulling at the reins of their horses as they dive into the, the, the forces. Or it's the winds that pluck the trees out, they yank the trees out of the ground. You can see that diving and pulling out is any number of interpretations. And the most famous of these opinions, in fact, is that it's the angels that pull back, pull, pull the souls of the, the children of Adam out. Bint Shata is going to actually disagree with that. And I'm, I'm, after doing a lot of study and pondering and thinking of my own, I have come to find myself more convinced of her position. I want to start by saying, I'm not saying this is the right interpretation. I am saying that this is the interpretation I find most convincing. You have to do your own reading, come to your own conclusions, right? And that's, that's, and if you would think that one Sahabi's opinion is sacred, then you would never find another Sahabi with a completely different opinion, and yet another Sahabi with a completely different opinion. That in and of itself is evidence that this is an exercise left for all of humanity. And on the note of contemplating on the Qur'an, I want to say a couple of quick things. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave us the Qur'an, the greatest teacher of humanity taught us the Qur'an, Rasulullah himself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You ever wonder, 114 surahs, how come Allah's Messenger did not comment on every single ayah. I would imagine Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, all of the books of hadith should be full, first and foremost of what? Explanation of every single ayah. So we don't have to have any disagreements, it's solved. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa done deal. That would be finished. Because once he gives an interpretation, there's no room for me to say, no, 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 it could mean something else, or it could mean this, or it could mean that. It's over. Our messenger spoke sallallahu alayhi wa But he didn't speak. And there's a wisdom in the fact that he didn't speak. First of all, there's so much wisdom inside every ayah, that if the messenger began to explain the wisdom of one ayah, then the rest of his mission wouldn't be over. Because this word is so deep, it's like oceans that don't come to an end. Second of all, our messenger was given this book. What was the purpose of this book? لِيَدَّبَّرُوا ayatihi. So people, they reflect on the ayat. So they reflect on the ayat. If the Messenger ﷺ did all the reflecting, then what would we do? Nothing. We'd say, we just, he already did the work. We don't have to think about the ayat of Allah. Then the ayat, afala ta'aqilun, why don't you understand? Why don't you apply your intellect? Why don't you ponder? Why don't you think of, and by the way, tadabbur, which I'm translating as reflection, comes from dubur, which means behind. Allah said this. What is, what is behind this? What's the deeper view of this? Let me take a closer look. You know, to understand something, how we say in English, inside and out? You know? Or you said this, well, what is behind what you're saying? You know? What could, be, what could possibly be the intent? That is an exercise Allah wanted human beings to engage in. And what a beautiful, intimate exercise between the slave and the master. The master spoke, and the slave is wondering, I wonder what my master is saying here. Let me ponder. And another slave comes and he ponders. And the slaves, by definition, are humble. They're humble. And they're in awe of the words of their master. So when a slave says, I think, only Allah knows, but I think this is what he means. And someone says, you might be right, but I think this is what it means, and here are my reasons. People aren't going to make up meanings, they're going to think a lot, and research a lot, and, and ponder a lot, and look at the language carefully, and the context carefully, before they come to a conclusion about what they think it means. But you know, everyone has different levels of knowledge, different levels of experience, different backgrounds, and so they're going to see different things. And they're going to engage in that exercise. That exercise is a beautiful, beautiful connection between a slave and the master. 
That's a gift Allah gave us in the Qur'an. And you know what's happened in so many parts of the world? I can at least speak with confidence of the part of the world that I come from, South Asia. Recite the Qur'an. If you think about it, you might, shaitan might get to you. Because you might start wondering how this ayah applies to your life, and you might be wrong. And if you're wrong, then you're going to be misguided. And you're going to end up, you know, just, you know what? There are people with much longer beards than yours. That do that 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 have read people other people's reflections. Let them do the thinking about the Quran. Your job is not to think about the Quran. You just recite it and let other people think about it, because you're not qualified to think about it. Tell me something. When these ayat came, the majority of the this is early Quran, isn't it? Early Quran, early Quran. The audience is non-Muslims. They're non-Muslims. Those non-Muslims, if they had the same attitude, this is not for us to think about. This is for some alim to think about. This is for a talibul ilm to think about. This is for a student to think about. If you haven't studied tajweed, if you hadn't studied Arabic and nahu and sarf and adab, and you haven't read ulum al-Quran and tafsir and this and this and this, until then, you, until you do all of this, you can't be thinking about the Quran. Then would anybody have thought about the Quran? <laughs> would anybody? Would Abu? You know? Would Umar bin al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu ever thought about the Quran? You know? How would they have pondered? What brought them to Islam to begin with is the fact that they thought about what was being said. They considered it for themselves. They asked questions. I, Allah says, ayatun lissailin. These are ayat for people who ask questions. When do you ask questions? When you don't understand something. When do you ask questions? When you become curious. I wonder what this means. How could this benefit me? You're supposed to come to the Quran with questions. And our assumption that somebody who has studied ilm Somebody who studied tafsir, somebody who studied the Qur'an with a teacher, with a shaykh and got an ijazah, has the answers to the Qur'an is false. All humanity, if all of our minds were put together to study the word of Allah, we would only get drops out of this endless ocean. We have to be humble to the word of Allah. So while the, you might think what I'm saying is being arrogant with the book of Allah, I'm actually saying that is humility with the book of Allah. Nothing supersedes the word of Allah. No one attempt of any one human being. The only interpretation we will say, you know, we sami'na wa ata'na, and there's no qawl after it, is the word of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that's it. Other than that, it's our, it's our genuine, sincere exercise. Ya Allah, what are you saying? This is why we have a, pro a profoundly diverse history of tafsir. This is why there are so many interpretations of the Qur'an. Because people made genuine exercises. And of course there's criticism between them. Of course there are debates between them. And that, that will continue. By the way, this is the nature of knowledge itself. That's the last side comment. The nature of knowledge itself. Scientific knowledge, historical knowledge, the knowledge of any field. If you're in medical school, if you're studying engineering, if you're studying programming, what programming was 30 years ago is not what it is now. People came along, critiqued, refined, revisited, enhanced, you know, and they, they furthered that knowledge. Same thing with biology, same thing with medicine, same thing with architecture, same thing in every single field. Human beings don't say, well, this was already studied, we don't have to revisit it. They go back, ponder over it again, they look at it again carefully, and they discover more, and then they discover more. And this is the study of the ayat. Creation is also called ayat, revelation is also called ayat. The formula by which Allah furthers knowledge in humanity is not different between revelation and creation. It's the exercise of pondering and asking questions. So may Allah Azza wa Jal make us sincere students. I don't want this to be, well I read this ayah and I feel like this, it says this. It's not just about our feelings. It is a genuine inquiry. But most importantly, if the attitude is correct, this is the word of my master, I will come to it with humility, but I will think about what Allah says. I don't want to bend the word of Allah to what I want it to mean. I want to bend myself to what is what I find most convincing. I, this is the this is the nature of our relationship with Allah's book. May Allah Azza wa Jal you know grant us sincerely sincerity in our journey to Allah's book. So she says, uh, Rahimahullah. نحن أكثر إطمئنانا إلى تفسير النازعات بال بال المغيرة دون تحديد لها بخير الغزات كما قال الزمخشري وغيره من المفسرين. She says what I find most convincing about this these ayat, the ones that pull as they dive. That's what she's talking about. She says, what I find the most convincing is this is talking about horses that are being ridden by raiders, by looters, by bandits. Back in the Arab times, 
One village, one town gets raided by another town in the middle of the night. That's what happens. And they get robbed. And how do you, you don't rob somebody on a camel. You don't do that. That's like robbing somebody with a shopping cart, like, <laughs> that's not going to work. You don't rob somebody with a donkey. You rob somebody with horses. You'll come and you raid quickly, you raid their camp quickly, and you get out of there in the dark of night. That's what you have to do. She says, no, no, no. I also, she says, I'm strongly inclined to believe this is talking about raiders that are robbing a village or robbing or, or raiding a, a, a town. And it's not talking about the Muslims fighting in the path of Allah. She disagrees with Zamakhshari and others who said this must be the believers fighting in the path of Allah, riding their horses against the enemies. You know, and she gives her reasons. Because they were so influenced by this idea that Allah swears by something, it must be something sacred or something noble or something honored. And that's why, well, which horse riders are going to be noble? Not the kuffar, not the robbers. It's going to be Muslims who are fighting in the path of Allah. And that's what inspired them to say that this must be the mujahideen in the path of Allah that are being talked about. And she says, but in the Makkan Qur'an, there were no Muslims with a horse that's going into battle. What are you talking about? When these ayat were first heard, nobody even knew that Muslims are going to go into battle. No Muslim was thinking, I'm going to be riding on a horse, going into... All the Qur'an was saying was, be patient, make da'wah, be patient, make da'wah. The Qur'an was not saying, just give it seven, eight years, you'll be on a horse, watch. That's not what it was saying. So she's like, this doesn't even occur to anybody who was at that time. وَلَكَانَ هُنَاكَ دَارُ سَلَامٍ وَدَارُ حَرْبٍ يَخْرُجُ الْغُزَاتُ مِنْهَا وَإِلَيْهَا There was no land of Islam and land against we have war. There was no Makkah versus Medina. So there's going to be a Badr or Uhud or Ahzab. There was no such thing then. وَالْقَوْلُ بِأَنَّ هَذَا سَوْفَ يَكُونُ بَعْدَ الْهِجْرَى لَا مَجَالَ لَهُ هُنَا مَعَ هَذَا اللَّفْتِ إِلَى وَاقِعٍ مَشْهُودٍ and to say that Allah is saying that this will happen. Okay, fine, it didn't happen yet. But some people are saying, but Allah knew that it was going to happen, so He called it ahead of time. And so He's saying that this is referring to something that will happen in the future. She says that doesn't make any sense because the Makki Qur'an is not about making vague you know, extrapolations about the future, which mean nothing to the people in front of it. It's giving da'wah to them to the truth. And it calls on something from their experience. Yesterday when I was explaining to you, doesn't Allah call on you to observe the sun, the star, the, you know, the, the sun, the mountain, the earth, things you see around you. So she says, when Allah makes an argument like this, it necessarily is biwaqi'in mashhud, something people have seen, something people have experienced. You know like a good teacher gives you an example you can relate to? That's what Allah is doing. He's giving an example that the entire audience that's sitting there listening should be able to relate to. That's the point that she's making. And would the Qur'an really talk about something so unseen that anybody who hears it, even the Muslims will be confused, I wonder what that means. وَقَدْ لَفَتَ الْقُرْآنِ فِي سُورَةِ الْعَادِيَاتِ إِلَى الْخَيْدِ عَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحًا And the Qur'an did this in other places like وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحًا That's the example is coming again. Now, what's, what she then argues is if you were to accept this interpretation, which again, I, I'll share with you why I'm inclined towards it, because the, the rest of the surah fits with that like a glove. Like there's no takalluf, there's no hardship in showing the continuity of the message of the surah if you take this route. So she says, يُوَجِّهُ الْآيَاتِ if you were to take this interpretation, the rest of the surah becomes easy and you don't have to do any creative interpretation to understand the message of the rest of the surah. And so let's first look at how she's referring to this. Like, this is so much fun. وَالنَّازِعَاتِ نَزَعْ in Arabic الْجَذَبْ وَالشِدْ وَالْقَلَعْ To pull at something. But when you add نَازِعَاتِ غَرْقًا It's actually in the Arabic language. When you pull something as far as you can pull. Like, a, like an arrow that's been pulled by the bow as more, you can't pull it anymore, maximum tension. That's actually called naz'ul gharq. Meaning you couldn't pull it any possibly more. That's the most you could pull it. Okay, a hard, hard pull. So that's the meaning of naz'a to pull. But on the other side, wal gharqu fil asli lughawi bi ma'na rusub fil ma. Originally, gharq actually means drowning into the water. وَيُسْتَعْمَلُوا مَجَازًا فِي إِغْرَاقِ الْبَلَاءِ وَالنِّعْمَةِ And it's also used figuratively when somebody is drowning in goodness 
or drowning in trouble. Like we use nowadays, man, I'm drowning. Or people say, man, that guy's swimming in money. Or he's drowning in money. Don't we say that? It's the same actual expression figuratively in the Arabic language. كما يقال أغرق النازع في القوس استوفى مدها And that extreme is also used. The, 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 the archer has drowned the arrow into the bow. Literally. Drowned the arrow means the bow is almost, the, the, the arrow is entirely inside of the bow. It couldn't be pulled anymore. Um, there's some inappropriate examples too, but hey, I'm teaching a Quran right now, so it's all good. Imra'atun taghtariqu nazarahum ay tushghiluhum bin nazar ilayha an in nazar ila ghayriha li husniha. They say in this Arabic figure of speech, that woman drowned everybody's eyes. And what that means is when she walked in, all the men started staring at her and they forgot there's any other woman in the room. And that's, that's how they use the drowning, meaning just completely lost in this one thing. Now, the reason I shared all of that with you, yeah, sometimes you read things like that and you say, no, no, I'm studying Islam. So, غَايَةُ الْمَدْ حَتَّى يَنْتَهِ إِلَى الْفَصْلِ What this is referring to is there, there are horses, it's dark, the tribe, like they're on top of a hill, I will paint the movie scene for you. There's a sleeping village down there. And this, these guys are lined up over the hill. And nobody should move yet, right? The horses shouldn't be moving. So what are they doing to their horses? They're pulling on their reins. Because when you pull on the reins of your horse, what, do you, what does the horse do? It stops. And they're holding the reins, holding the reins, holding the reins. And the horse understands that language. The moment you release the reins, what's the horse going to do? It's gonna march, right? So when Nazi'ati Gharqa is holding the tension as much as humanly possible. And then when we go to when Nashitati Nashta, when Nashtu Filluha Yustamalu Aslan Filakd Alladhi Yashalu Hullahu. Yashulu Halluhu actually. It's Nashata is used in Arabic for a knot or something that holds something together that can easily be undone. Like if you're not good at tying your shoes and they easily come undone, that's nashat actually. Or anshuta they call it also. And so the idea of something that gets released or softened. In other words, they're holding on, holding on, wait, 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 and all of a sudden, go. And they release it. When nashitati nashta, they let it go entirely. And when, when that happens, what's gonna take place next? The horses are gonna go downhill. They're gonna go and raid. She, so she says about this ayah, about when nashitati nashta, وَنُؤْثِرُ أَن نُضِيفَ إِلَيْهِ مَا يَرْبُطُهُ بِأَصْلِهِ اللُّغَوِي إِفْلَاتًا مِنَ الْعِقَالِ Loosening up of the reins of the horse, to let it go, to unleash it. وَالسَّابِحَاتِ سَبْحَ السَّبْحَ الْعَوْمُ وَالْأَصْلُ فِيهِ أَنْ يَكُونَ فِي الْمَا سَبْح in Arabic actually means to swim or to float. It's used for, for boats, it's used for a safina, it's used for a fulk, you know, it's used for a swimmer. And Allah says literally here, and they swim smoothly, or they swim piercing through. وَالسَّابِحَاتِ sabha. And the, the, the maf'ul mutlaq that's been added here, sabihat is enough, but وَالسَّابِحَاتِ sabhan. It's not just a hal, it's also a mutlaq. In other words, they really swim. They are piercing through the water. What this is doing is, وَيُسْتَعَرُوا لُغَةً لِلْخَيْلِ فَيُقَالُوا لَهَا السَّوَابِحِ This was actually figuratively used for horses. They would say sometimes the horses are swimming. You know the desert is the ocean of land, right? And so in the desert, the horses are what? Swimming in that ocean. And you know how the water, when a, when a fast boat goes through it, or a shark is going through the water, and it's on the surface, what happens in the water? There's a wake in the back. It's like it's tearing through the water, isn't it? When horses are running in the desert, aren't they leaving a wake behind? Aren't they tearing through the land? They're leaving a similar effect as the ocean leaves when a speedboat goes through, or a jet ski goes through, or back in the day a shark goes through. You know, or a, or a vessel, a fast vessel of, of uh, you know, make, like a, a boat goes through. So wasabi hati sabha is basically describing, this is the kind of thing that you see in the seas, but these incredible animals are showing you that scene on the land. كما يجيء في القرآن لسبح النجوم في الفلك وكل في فلك يسبحون. It's also used for floating or swimming in the air, meaning move, flying. And that's actually similar to when we talk about how man, that car is flying. 
That car is flying. So there are two implications of wasabi hati sabha now to add to this image. On the one hand, it's piercing through the land. It's violent. Like the, like the water is being torn open as the vessel goes, the earth is being wrecked as these horses go through. So it's violent extreme and aggressive. On the other hand, the speed with which they're moving can be compared to flying. And those are the two intense you know, notions that are added to this image. Now that the horses have been released, it's only natural that they're gonna go super fast, and that's what Sabi Hati Sabhan. The scene is now intensified. And so as we move forward, we're gonna see wasab fasabi qati sabqan. Then there's no surprise. The fa here is actually to show that immediately and thereafter quickly. Now there's a for Arabic students, there's musabiq and there's sabiq. Musabiq means someone who races. Sabiq means someone who gets there first. Like wasabiqun sabiqun. Sabiqun are those who get there first. The, translated the first and the foremost, right? So wasab fasabiqati sabqa means they get there super fast. They get to their destination in no time. Which tells you that they had their target in sight, they moved very quickly. It's incorrect translation to say, and they race with one another. If some suggest that, thus racing and you know surpassing one another. That would actually be be fal musabiqati sibaqan, not fasabiqati sabqan. That's a different, wasn't altogether, sabaka, not sabaka. Okay, so now, now they get there. Now the thing is, this is what I was waiting for. What's gonna happen when they get there? Now, now it's on. Now the scene begins. But before we get there, just a couple of quick things. Malhuvan fihi ma'na sur'a wal mubadara. When Allah says, fasabiqati sabqa, they get there quickly, they get there immediately. Wasti'maluhu fil khayl wa qareeb. And using that for horses is so obvious. وَذَهَبُوا إِلَىٰ تَأْوِيلِ السَّابِقَاتِ إِلَىٰ أَنَّهَا وَصْفٌ لِهَذِهِ أَوْ تِلْكَ فَالْمَلَائِكَةُ تَسْبِقُوا إِلَىٰ تَدْبِيرِ شُؤُونِ الْكَوْنِ بِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ Those are the other interpretations you can find them in tafsir. Like the angels are taking the, the souls up and they're racing up or they're, they get there super quickly, etc., etc. She's disagreeing with that and this, by the way, also existed classically. So it's not just her opinion. She's more inclined towards this opinion. What I find unique about her contribution is she's providing a thorough rationale behind it. She's actually furnishing it with a thought process and a complete imagery that, that makes it holistic. Anyhow, so now, these horses clearly, and, and she added something I didn't say, she said when you swim, and especially when you swim fast, you prepare yourself. You don't just swim fast, just any, I'm just walk, you know, jumping in, I'm gonna go across the lake. You, 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 ha you have tahayyu, you have proper preparation. That makes complete sense because raiders don't just show up one day and say, hey, let's go rob them. They have a proper plan, they're disciplined. You can tell that they're very disciplined and everybody knows exactly what to do because they were all holding the reins back together. The fact that they got to their def you know, destination all together immediately means they're disciplined and they were properly prepared. So she's describing a raid, an attack that was meticulously planned. This was meticulously executed, okay? So now, as we go forward, the hard ayah, فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ amra. Dabbara in Arabic means two things, please understand that. Dabbara means to plan. Dabbara means to plan. Dabbara also means to execute the plan. Well, those are two different things. If someone's doing tadbir, they're basically in Arabic doing two things. They're not only making a plan, they're also executing the plan. And a lot of times people execute plans without making them. And a lot of times people make a lot of plans but never execute. What are you going to do? I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. There's all these plans and you don't do anything. You know? Like I have students like that. Ustad, which book should I read? And then which one? And when I'm done, then what should I read? I was like, which one have you read? No, I haven't read yet. I'm just downloading right now. I've got eight gigs of books downloaded. Which other book should I download? No, that's what your plan is, to download. Okay? Nothing's downloaded here, nothing's even streaming over here. But at least it's here on your device. That's, that's cute. You know? Read some... Like there are students, I'm teaching them something. And they're like, Ustad, when we're done with all this, then what are we gonna study? Listen, listen, you should be Ustad. Why don't you just learn what you're, we're learning right now? How, how about we do this? Because you're not good at it. Yeah, just focus on this. So there are people who plan, but don't execute. And there are people who execute without a plan. <laughs> Tadbir is actually planning and 
execution. Now, the imagery that was painted already suggests that there's a plan. What is this suggesting? It could mean two things. It could mean they plan out the decision. It could mean they are now executing their plan. In other words, it's an entire village in front of them. You're going to go left, you're going to go right, you're going to go middle, you're going to go exactly here. This is our exit. This is how many seconds we have to pull this heist off. Everybody knows their part, like a coordinated team, right? Like an like a organized offense in a sports team. That's al mudabbirati amra. Every one of these raiders knows exactly where they have to go. And so, وَأَصْلُ التَّدْبِيرِ فِي اسْتِعْمَالِ اللُّغَوِي أَنَّهُ مِنَ التَّفْكِيرِ فِي دُبُرِ الْأُمُورِ وَعَوَاقِبِهَا The origin of the word tadbir is actually to think thoroughly about what will happen if we do this versus what will happen if we do that. Every action has a consequence behind it. So let's permutate. Let's say if we do this, then that. If they go this way, go that way. If they attack you, defend this way. Blow this whistle, blow that horn, etc., etc. How are we going to warn each other? Because you know, when you execute a dangerous plan, there are multiple possibilities, aren't there? Tadbir means to consider all the possibilities and what is behind each of the options you take, and then put all of them together with, along with their consequences. عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ يُطْلَقُ عَادَةً عَلَىٰ تَوَلِّ الْأَمْرِ وَالنُّهُودِ بِتَنْظِيمِهِ وَإِدَارَتِهِ It's also used for developing and executing a plan well organized. دُونَ أَن تَنْقَطِعَ صِلَتُهُ بِالْأَصْلِ اللُّغَوِي وَقَدْ فَسَّرَهَا الرَّاغِبُ فِي النَّازِعَاتِ بِأَنَّهَا مَلَائِكَةً مُوَكَّلَةً Raghib al-Asfahani, among others, had this notion. This is a very popular notion you find in classical tafsir. Some absolutely rejected it. Others mentioned it very commonly, like Imam Razi, who said some angels are assigned different tasks in Allah's creation. And they're going to do their, they, they make the plans or whatever. And some said, no, all the plans are made by Allah, that's all shirk, etc. Okay, so now I'm going to read some of the opinions that she doesn't agree with, but you should know about them. Okay, about this. وفي الكشاف إن زمخ شريز بوك الكشاف أما إنها الملائكة تدبر أمرا من أمور العباد مما يصلحهم في دينهم أو دنياهم زمخ شريز says this is angels that are making plans for their slaves of Allah on the earth what will be good for them or what will be bad for them وأما إنها خيل الغزات تدبر أمر الغلبة والظفر or it's the horses of the believers meaning the mujahideen uh, who are now planning their victory and how to capture the enemy. وَإِمَّا أَنَّهَا النُّجُومُ تُدَبِّرُ أَمْرًا فِي عِلْمِ Which is weird. تُدَبِّرُ أَمْرًا فِي عِلْمِ الْحِسَابِ Or it's the, it's the sky, it's the stars that are making the calculations of, you know, of, 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 of different kinds of calculations, like almost like astrology. Sometimes you read weird stuff in tafsir. Anyway, وَفِي الْبَحْرِ الْمُحِيطِ لا أحفظ خلافا في أنها الملائكة التي تدبر الأمور التي سخرها الله تعالى وصرفها فيها. I have no qualms in expressing this can only mean angels. It doesn't mean anything else. Basically, angels make those plans. Just like Allah made other things that execute Allah's plan, like the winds and the and the and the, sky, and the, and the clouds, etc. Uh, and so different people presented this and here's what she says فَإِذَا فَهِمْنَا وَإِذْ فَهِمْنَا النَّازِعَاتِ بِالْخَيْلِ فِي نَزْعِهَا الْمُغْرِقِ وَسَبْقِهَا السَّابِقِ يَكُونُ التَّدْبِيرِ غَايَةَ مَا تَجَمَّعَتْ لَهُ قُوَاهَا فِي مَا أُرِدَ لَهَا مِنْ أَمْرِ الْغَلَبَ وَالْحَسَنِ This is epic. This is where I left the scene off. They went riding into the village, then what happened? Then what happens is, Quran says, either, two interpretations, one way of looking at it, is they all knew exactly where to attack and what to do. Coordinated effort, like I was mentioning. The other interpretation is, the attack was so quick, and it, the raid was so successful, and they came and they disappeared, and now they're back in their hiding place in the bat cave, and now they're actually planning out who gets what. You get 20%, you get to keep this, you get to keep that, and they're doing the tadbir among themselves. Of, of the raid that's already happened. Meaning it happens way too fast for anybody to even realize what happened and they're in and out of there. وَنَتَّفِقُ مَعَ الْمُفَسِّرِينَ فِي أَنَّ مَا بَعْدَ الْوَاوْ فِي الْآيَاتِ الثَّلَاثِ شِفَاتٌ لِمَوْصُوفْ وَاحِدٌ And that's actually, her interpretation is, and this is most mufassirun, how they interpret the first ayah, وَالنَّازِعَاتِ غَرْقَى They say everything else is description of that first one. It's not five different things, it's one thing with five attributes. One matter with five attributes, okay? Now, uh, uh, this is actually again a unique contribution. Before I tell you about it, I'll, I'll share with you uh, some background. There are, there are theories about how qasam works in the Qur'an. Theories about how to understand when Allah takes an oath. Simply speaking, when Allah says, I swear by time, or I swear by the sun, 
Or he says, I swear by the moon, or I swear by the morning, or I swear by etc. etc. Here he swore by battle horses. What is the purpose of Allah Azza wa Jal swearing? Basically, to make the long story short, there are two major opinions on how that's interpreted. Classically, there are two ways of looking at it. One way of looking at it is every time Allah takes an oath, He's making a big deal out of something. Litta'zim, what they call in Arabic, litta'zim. In other words, when he says, I swear by time, time is a big deal. When he says, I swear by the fig, or I swear by the olive, then the fig and the olive are both a really big deal. And the people who have that view of the oaths, when you study their interpretation of the Allah swearing by the fig, you'll find five pages of how the fig is awesome. Because Allah said, Allah swore by it, so it must be awesome. So let me just spend a lot of time pondering over the benefits of the fig or the benefits of the olive, etc, etc. Another view says no, that doesn't answer a very fundamental question. Just because Allah swore by something, doesn't answer the question, why is this oath in this surah, and another oath in another surah? Because they could be anywhere, and they'd still be awesome. But the fact that this one's here, must mean it's connected to what's coming. And the fact that that one's there, must be connected to what's coming over there. So there's this theory of Al-Qasam wa Jawab Al-Qasam. Uh, Al-Qasam wa Jawab Al-Qasam means when Allah takes an oath, when He says, I swear by time, there's something that He's, a no, an idea that He's tying it with. And every time He swears, He simply got your attention. Just like in English now, when I say, I swear to God. Everyone's like, what, what, what happened? You're expecting me to say, I can't just say, I swear to God and walk away. Unless I say I swear to God and it's understood. Like I swear to God, you guys are so disgusting, I can't even take it anymore. So I just say, I swear to God, and you just walk away. You walking away is actually saying, I'm disgusted with you. But I didn't even have to say it, and that's actually how disgusted I am with you. Right? It wasn't even worth words. But the words are still understood, aren't they? There's so, always something, something that follows the oath. So what Mufassirun do when they study Quran is sometimes Allah will take an oath, and then after the oath, he will give a response to that oath. What is it that, what was the point that he was making? And those two things are connected, like, I swear by time, humanity is in loss. Those two things are connected, because the loss of humanity, what's the greatest loss of humanity? Time. You could have anything else, health, wealth, money, status, fame, you could have looks, you could have anything. One thing you can't have, that you'll always be losing, and you can't get more of, is what? It's time. The ultimate evidence of loss is time. So those two things are connected to each other, right? He then, she argues actually that's not always the case. And she's right, that's not always the case. There are places in the Quran where Allah will take an oath and you're waiting for him to say, so what are you going to say after that? And he won't say anything. He doesn't give a, he doesn't give a jawab al-qasam. He doesn't give a response to the oath. That leaves Mufassirun perplexed. How do we fill this, fill in the blank? Because Allah left a blank. And so they say, well, let's compare this oath to other oaths in other surahs where he did fill in the blank. And maybe we'll borrow that fill in the blank over here. That's what he meant. He didn't have to say it because he already said it somewhere else. That's one way they, they fill the gap, right? So here he says, وَالنَّازِعَاتِ غَرْقَى وَالنَّاشِطَاتِ نَشْطَى وَالسَّابِحَاتِ سَبْحَى فَالسَّابِقَاتِ سَبْقَى فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ أَمْرَى All of this is the oath. What is the response to that oath? It's not mentioned, so some said. And this is, these are the opinions. قِيلَ يَكُونُ مَحْذُوفًا وَتَقْدِيرُهُ لَتُبْعَثُنَّ It's actually understood. It means, I swear to God, you will be resurrected. But he didn't have to say, you will be resurrected. It's understood. لِدَلَالَةِ مَا بَعْدَهُ عَلَيْهِ Because of what's coming after it. And this is, uh, Abu Hayyan mentions this. And وَأَنَّهُ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ الْمُخْتَارِ That's the preferred opinion with him. وَعَنِ التِّرْمِذِ أَنْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَعِبْرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَىٰ Later on in the surah, Allah will say, in all of that, there's a huge lesson for anybody who's afraid. I swear by the horses and all of what I just described to you, I swear by all of that, there's a great lesson here. That's the, that's to them is the whole sentence. But then, فيما يلي من السورة رده ابن لمباري بقوله هذا قبيح لأن الكلام قد طال. He says ابن لمباري says that's ugly because that's like the oath was here and one passage later 
you're connecting it back, that's too far apart. People lose their train of thought by then. You can't connect those two things because they're so far away. وَقِيلَ الْجَوَابِ لَيَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةِ تَتْبَعُهَا الرَّادِفَةِ خُذِفَتْ فِيهِ اللَّامِ well, If you put a lam at the beginning of a sentence, it means it's the response to the oath. So they say, Allah said, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةِ And some say, no, what he meant by that is لَا يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةِ He just didn't say the lam. But it's, you can imagine that it's there, and that's why this is the response to the oath. And لِأَنَّهُ فَصْلٌ بَيْلَ الْلَامِ الْمُقَدَّرَ وَالْفِعِلِ And they said, that, that's too much of a stretch. Why would you have to imagine a word is there when Allah didn't put it? If Allah wanted to put it there, He can put it there. Then وَقِيلَ التَّقْدِيرِ يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةِ أَنَّا وَالنَّازِعَاتِ Then some said, no, the ayat are in reverse. Because the next ayah that's coming is the day on which the, sh- the, the earth that is always meant to shake, when it's, when it's, com- it's going to shake violently. So they say, no, we should read this in reverse. The day on which the earth shakes violently, I swear by the horses. So reverse it. And so that, that exists also. وَرَفَضَهُ أَبُو حَيَانَ Abu Hayyan responded to it by saying, لَيْسَ بِشَيْءٍ That ain't nothing. I don't know where you came up with that. I love those. I love the Laysa Bishay. What is that? Seriously? Like if, th- if he was writing that today, he'd just write, seriously? Question mark. And that's all he'd say. You know. فَإِذَا هُمْ بِالسَّارِهِ وَالنَّازِعَاتِ خَطَّأَهُ إِبْنُ الْلَبَّارِي لِأَنَّ الْفَاهِ يُفْتَتَحُ بِالْكِلَامِ Some said, no, no, no. The first ayah was supposed to be فَإِذَا هُمْ بِالسَّارِهِ A later ayah. And Ibn al-Labari says, what are you talking about? Speech doesn't begin with a fa in Arabic. Don't you know Arabic? You know, so, so they would do that in their books. What's sad is, Al-Jawab, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى لِأَنَّهُ فِي تَقْدِيرِ قَدْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ Abu Hayyan says, لَيْسَ بِشَيْءِ That's nothing to... One after the other theories are presented about what the missing blank would be. And quite honestly, the, the most beautiful answer that I see here is the one presented by Bint Shatiq, رحمه الله. I do find it very convincing. Here's what she says. فَنَحْتَاجُ مَعَهُ إِلَى تَسْوِيَةِ الْقَاعِدَةِ فِي وُجُوبِ دُخُولِ اللَّامِ عَلَى الْفِعْلِ مُؤَكَّدًا بِالنُّونِ فِي جَوَابِ الْقَسَمِ First of all, we have to get rid of the notion that you have to have a lam and you have to have a noon. Every time there's a qasam, there has to be a jawab al-qasam. Allah's speech is free of cages. Allah's speech broke and evolved the rules of Arabic. The rules of poetry, the rules of grammar, the rules of vocabulary, the rules of word usage. Think of any, any chapter of linguistics, Qur'an took a creative approach. Any chapter of linguistics. Uh, verbal idioms, in, in verbal idioms, Muslim Samir said it beautifully. He said every verse of the Qur'an, virtually every verse presented some kind of a language problem for those who are accustomed to typical language. Because the Qur'an just keeps defying the norm, defining new boundaries. So when you're trying to cage one principle on the Qur'an and saying every surah of the Qur'an must abide by this theory, then that theory supersedes Qur'an. He says you can't, the, the, the word of Allah supersedes all theories. You cannot come up with an overarching theory and impose it onto the Qur'an. It's the word of Allah. يَعْلُوا وَلَا يُعْلَى عَلَيْهِ It supersedes, it is not superseded. In, وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا The word of Allah lies in its supreme place. So what does she say? Sometimes the oath is taken and the natural effect of the oath is it gets everybody's attention. It gets everybody's attention. Now that I have your attention, let me change the subject altogether. And by the way, that's perfect. Remember how the horses were being pulled and there was great tension? Remember when the horses went down into the raid? There was great tension and you were wondering what happened? And Allah didn't tell you? He just said it got done? And you would really want to know what was all this about. And Allah switches the subject immediately and says, Yawma tarjufur rajifa. Listen carefully now. This will all make sense now. The day on which the violent shaking, the, the earth violently shakes. And the name of the earth in this ayah is ar rajifa. Al ard ar rajifa is actually the word. And rajifa means. Something that shakes, but not something that is shaken, something that shakes. Now, let me just help you explain, uh, understand that visually. Am I shaking? Or is the pen shaking? I'm shaking it, right? I'm shaking it. So I'm the rajif, this is the marjuf in Arabic. If the earth was being shaken, I was expecting Allah to say, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الْمَرْجُوفَةِ the earth that is shaken. 
Allah, instead of calling the earth the thing that gets shaken, calls it the thing that shakes. Rajifa. In other words, that day, it's not just that the earth is shaking. It's that the earth is shaking everything else up. The earth is actually the culprit now. You don't ask what happened to the earth. The earth is doing it to you. The earth is the culprit. It is, by the way, describing something. The horses wanted to move. What was happening? What was Allah doing? Holding them back. Now we're learning all this time, Allah has been holding the earth back. It wants to shake. When the horses trample down the, the hill and raid the village, what's going to happen in the village? It's going to shake. And the only thing holding back from the village from shaking is the rains being pulled back. Allah is holding back the rains of the earth because it wants to shake so badly. It wants to raid so badly. But that day, He'll let it go. He'll let it go. Judgment day will be like that night raid that the villagers sleeping completely heedless and unaware of their attackers will not see coming. يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ rajifa. When the shaking happens, they'll wake up all of a sudden, well, what's going on? You know, like the raid. And when you go outside and you see the attack and you see one horse go by, you're like, oh, thank God they're gone. And guess what? Another wave behind, تَتْبَعُهَا الرَّادِفَةَ and, no, and the next wave of them comes and attacks also. This is actually Allah saying, if you ever want to imagine what the Day of Judgment is going to be like, وَلَيَأْتِيَنَّهُمْ بَغْتَةً وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ It'll come to them out of nowhere, they won't have any idea that it's coming. When, that, when it comes like that, man, it's going to be like that raid. See, when you talk to people who don't believe in the afterlife, like the Quraysh didn't believe in the afterlife. How do you, how do you get, make them visualize what they're going to feel on Judgment Day? Well, how can you relate to the shock that's going to happen on Judgment Day? When you won't know what's going on. وَتَرَ النَّاسَ سُكَارَ وَمَا هُمْ بِسُكَارَ You're going to see people, they look like they're drunk and they're not drunk at all. People are going to be standing around looking at this horse go by, that horse go by, somebody swipes a sword at them, somebody picks this up, what's going This camp's on fire, that house is broken down. People running around screaming and you're just like, oh, I'm confused, what's <laughs> happening? You know, when that's going on, people look drunk and they're not drunk at all. This is how Allah makes arguments. This is how Allah does a switch from one subject to the next. يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ rajifa, The thing that is meant to shake, the day on which when, when it shakes. By the way, in the case of the village, the horses were causing the shaking. But in the case of the earth, the earth itself is doing the shaking. The earth itself is the raider. You don't need a raider from the outside. The one that will attack you on judgment day is under your feet already. Al-ittirabu shadid Intense disturbance. You know what they call rajifa? When I, when I keep calling shaking, you know what it is? They say in Arabic, لُغَةً يُسْتَعْمَلُ لُغَةً فِي الرَّاجِحِ أَلْحُمَّ ذَاتُ الرَّعْدَ the, the kind of fever that makes you shiver and shake, that's actually called rajif. When the earth shivers with its fever. Goodness. Other places in the Qur'an, Allah will describe the earth like a pregnant woman giving birth on Judgment Day. وَأَلْقَتْ مَا فِيهَا وَتَخَلَّتْ It will release what is inside and be relieved. And a woman shakes when she's giving birth. She trembles with pain because she has to let go. This earth has been holding in a lot of sinners, a lot of secrets, a lot of evil that it wants to testify against. The earth doesn't disobey Allah. The people on this earth disobey Allah. The sky doesn't disobey Allah, but they are witness to the disobedience of Allah. You know how when you see something bad, you have a bad reaction? The earth actually wants to have a bad reaction when sin happens on the earth. It doesn't want to see the disobedience to Allah. But Allah says, calm down. I'll let you react, but not yet. I'll let you react, but not yet. And sometimes, it can't take it anymore, so Allah lets it have a little bit of a reaction. ظَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِ النَّاسِ In Surah Al-Rum. Corruption came out in the land and in the sea because of some sins that people had earned. لِيُذِيقَهُمْ بَعْضَ الَّذِي عَمِلُوا So they can get a taste of at least some things they've done. Because Judgment Day, they'll get a taste of all the things they've done. But for now, let's get, let's get them a little preview. 
So the major, you know, cataclysmic events that happen, a tsunami that happens or an earthquake that happens, that's not for that particular nation or that particular people, but that's just to remind people overall on the earth, your sins, the earth is hurt by it. The earth is actually, you know, uh, uh, injured by it. And it reacts sometimes. It can't even help. It gets a fever and it shakes. It gets a fever from what you're doing and it shakes. Subhanallah. Urjifa al-qawm idha khadu fi akhbar al-fitan wal-ifk. Urjifa means when people are disturbed when they hear some news. Arjafu idha tahayya ulil harb. I love this one. Another meaning of irjaf is actually when you when people prepare for war. Which ties perfectly. Qaribun min al-naz' al-mughriq hina tatahayya ul-khayl al-ma'raka. It's the image before because what was ready for the war? The horses were. And now Allah says, just like they were ready for war against their enemies, the earth will be ready for war against you. The earth itself. يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةً And so, I'll just give you one more ayah inshaAllah ta'ala and I'll, I'll, uh, maybe two more ayat, I'll give you a break. وَالْأَصْلُ فِيهِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضِ الْمَجُوفَةً وَرَاجِفَةً أَنَّ التَّابِعَةً مَرْدُوفَةً لَا رَادِفَةً أَنَّ حَفْرَةَ الْقَبْرِ مَحْفُورَةً لَا حَافِرَة the words Allah uses, all of them are shocking. It's, we were expecting mahfura, marjufa, mardufa. Allah uses the other way, hafira, radifa, and I'll explain in English what that means in a bit. وَكَذَلِكَ sahira. Now listen, when you say the earth is shaking, when an attack happens, at the time the attack is happening, you don't ask the question, who did this? When do you ask that question? When it's all done, People are collecting the dead, they're, they're, they're repairing the damages. There needs to be an investigation. Who raided us? At the time, all you see is a sword on a horse and it's coming at you. It doesn't matter who did what. This is why Allah did not mention who's shaking the earth. He just said the earth is shaking. He just put the credit on the earth. Why does Allah do that on Judgment Day? إِذَا الْأَرْضُ مُدَّتْ إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ إِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ Allah doesn't say, Allah will dim the stars, Allah will fold up the sun, Allah will stretch the earth. No, no, no. The earth got stretched, the sun got folded up. وَجُمِعَ الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ The sun and the moon collided with each other. Who's doing it? At the time, you don't care. At the time, that's not even, who's doing that? Hey, we should hold someone responsible. No, no, no. There's too much of a state of emergency at that time. That's not even on your mind. And that's why it's captured that way. وَهُنَا أَيْضًا مُبَاغَةَ The shock and the immediate nature of what will happen. That your mind isn't even working to think who's doing it. لَا يَدْرِي مَعَهَا الْإِنسَانِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ مِنْ أَيْنَ جَاءَ الرَّجَفِ وَتَرْكِيزٌ لِلْإِنْتِبَاحِ فِي أَخْذِهِ الرَّجْفَ All he can think about is, he's not thinking, where did this shaking come from? All he's thinking about is, my goodness, it's shaking. You know? The only words that will come out of him it would what? مَا لَهَا وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا What's wrong with it? Why is it doing that? And so we get to وَتَتْبَعُهَا الرَّادِفَ Radifa in Arabic is when, when people ride on a horse there's a guy riding in the back like motorcycles you know people, somebody rides in the back that guy is a radif okay, he's sitting, sitting in the back Radifa also means a second wave, like a wave comes and a wave comes on top of it, that's Radif. From it we get Muradifat or Mutaradifat in the Arabic language, which is close to the English word synonyms. This word follows that word in meaning. This is Radif. Okay? It's used in the Quran, Asa an yakuna radifa lakum tasta'jilun. Maybe some of the things that you've been rushing to judgment day, some of those things will follow immediately. You'll get some taste of judgment day even sooner. And so this ayah, what it's saying is that that first wave of attack will come and immediately following it, another wave of attack will come. You know when that first wave of attack happens, people are like, oh my God, we just got attacked. Oh, thank God it's over. Oh, wait. again, you got hit again. You didn't see it coming, right? That's that second wave of attack. So Zamakhshari interpreted it as, as follows. He says, "Anafkhatani tattabi'u thaniya al-ula wa talhaqu biha." It's the second blowing of the horn. The first horn is the first attack. The second blown is the second attack. The reason that's not as convincing is Allah says, "Tatbauha al-radifa." Follows it immediately, and radif means immediately following anyway. And the problem is between the first and the second. Remember yesterday, there's ages between the two. So this is referring to something that's happening in much more quicker succession. وَقِيلَ الرَّاجِفَةَ هِيَ الْأَرْضِ وَالرَّادِفَةَ السَّمَاءِ تَنْشَقُّ وَتَنْتَثِرُ كَوَاكِبُهَا And others say, no, Rajifa is when the earth shakes and Radifa is the sky starts falling apart. 
What's immediately following the earth shaking is the sky falling apart. And then there's yet another position that I find the most convincing about it, which is So the first wave is actually resurrection. Or the first wave is when the earth starts shaking. And what follows it immediately is people coming out of their graves. People are just, they don't even, they were sleeping. By the way, that's important because first somebody was sleeping, then they heard a shake, and then when they woke up, they got up, and now they're in shock. What's going on? Is everything okay? Right? And when they say everything's, is everything okay, you'll appreciate the next ayah, قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ wajifa. Hearts on that day are going to be deeply disturbed. They're going to wake up in shock. We were all asleep in our graves. Allah had given death to all creation and then were raised all of a sudden after that shaking. That's the radifa when we are absolutely terrified and our eyes have khushu' in them. Khushu' in Arabic is several things. Khushu' means humility. Humility out of fear. But khushu' in this particular context means something else. It actually means idlal. It means humiliation. Your hearts are terrified and disturbed, but deep down inside, you know why this is happening. This is happening because you're about to be taken to trial. I can give you some sense of what that feels like at least from personal experience, what that feels like. When you have a bad report card as a kid, and you know your mom is reading it, and she hasn't responded to you yet, and you can see that she's already opened it, and you can see the look on her face change, and then she says, Fatima. Then before she said Fatima, your qalb was wajif. Qulubun yawma idhin wajif. Oh, it's coming. And as you approach her, are you making eye contact? Your eyes are humbled. You can't even look up. You're so scared about what's going to happen. Because you already know. That's absaruha khashia. I love giving teaching and students study geeky examples. Because that's all I do. My favorite was in the first year when I started the dream program, I used to grade the exams. And um, I used to play games with students when I hand them the exams back. So my thing was, it's something called the march of shame. So when you, when you give the exams, you could just pass the exams out. But no, no, no. Why don't you come up and collect your exam? Oh, so much fun. So... You know, even the students who got like a hundred on the test, I'll just look at it like, Abdul Karim, and I'll fold up the paper and give it to him. Because I wouldn't want anybody else to see that. And he's like, and he's not making eye contact. Then he looks at it and goes, oh. And when they do that, then it's not folded anymore. It's like waving like a flag as they walk back past those other students. And they accidentally drop it like four times on their way. Oops. And it falls the wrong side where you don't see the hundred, so they flip it over and then pick it up. But what happens to the students who know they messed up? Before I even call their name, where are they? Are they in the front of the class? They're in the back. Where are their heads? Looking up? Nope. Avoiding eye contact. You already know what you did. There's a feeling in your heart. You already know what you did. And when your name is called, there's a humility that over, there's a humiliation that's just, your, your eyes are dripping with it. You may not be crying, but your eyes tell a story. When, you're, when you've been a disappointment, Allah Azza wa Jal describes the terror of Judgment Day, قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ wajifa. Allah describes the humiliation of Judgment Day. أَبْصَارُهَا khashia. You would wonder, why did He say أَبْصَارُهَا? Why didn't he say wal absaru qulubun absarun? Hearts will be tre- will be disturbed, trembling, and then on the other side, eyes will be humbled. No, the the eyes of those hearts, absaruha, the eyes of those hearts. There's an ittisal between absar and qalb because the eyes are feeling what they're feeling. The eyes look the way they look because the heart has what it has. These eyes are today connected to the heart directly. 
And you can tell from the look of those eyes that those hearts are broken. There's something wrong. Absaruha khashia. What a way Allah paints a picture of what's, what's happening on Judgment Day. And so, as they get up, there are two interpretations. This is what I'm going to leave you with. Two interpretations. The next ayat, some say, these are kuffar making fun of akhirah. Others say, no, this is still Judgment Day. They get up on Judgment Day. Absaruha khashi'atun yaquluna inna lamardooduna fil hafira. Are we seriously going to be thrown into the ditch? Are we, or, or it could be interpreted, are we the ones that were already thrown into the ditch? We were already in the grave. Why are we out? I thought this was over. I was gone already. You remember how the last surah ended? Ya laytani kuntu turaba. If I could only be dirt, what is that dirt? It's a hafira, it's a ditch in the ground. So one interpretation is, they will say this today. Oh, you think we're going to come out of the graves? We're going to be brought back into the graves? But no, it could also be, we for ser- seriously, the ones that have already been mardud in the hafira, we've already been thrown inside of the graves, we've already been done with, what are we doing here? Why are we here? This can't be right. Can I just go back and die again? This is actually another way of saying, Ya laytani kuntu turaba. That's another way of looking at these ayat. Inna la marduduna fil hafira. And so, and they are in shock. All of this, after we've been broken, decayed bones, bones that are hollow from the inside, nakhir in Arabic is actually something hollow. Lahu thaqab. It's got a hollowness and that's why it's brittle. It breaks easily. Bali. It breaks easily. It collapses. We were the kinds of bones that are hollow and break easily. It's the sound. Nakhir is the sound that hollow bones make. You know how kids, weird kids sometimes, they take those bones and they make whistle sounds out of them? Like socially awkward children? It's, that's what that is. When we were turned into that, we were brought back from that. So there's two views, right? The one view is, this is people critiquing Judgment Day, making fun of it. Oh, after we're bones and dust, we're going to be raised. On the other, it's actually that's those same words that were being said sarcastically in this world are going to be said with great humiliation. On, in that world. And that's why I personally hold the view that these words actually have a duality. They carry a duality. It's like you're saying these exact words now sarcastically, and you'll be saying these exact words with great humiliation on Judgment Day. And you'll mean something completely different. You know? You'll, just, you'll, you'll be a different person. You know, the same words can be said with a completely different meaning? I leave you with that thought. The same exact words can be said with completely different meaning. You can call somebody brother. And the way you say it could mean I hate your guts. Assalamu alaikum, brother. The way you say it, you ain't my brother. And another way you say brother, he's family to you. It's closer to you than blood. It all depends on how you speak. Allah Azza wa Jal captures there's going to be two ways you're going to be speaking. One this way and one the other way. May Allah Azza give us a better understanding of Quran. Few more ayat to share with you before the day is up. Barakallahu li walakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.